every year, uh, JCFS partners with Chicago area synagogues to do a series of events, usually around a Shabbat, but now um, extending kind of the week before and after as well, where we focus in on a mental health issue that is affecting our community to raise awareness um, around its occurrence um, with inner communities, our families, our own lives, and also connecting people with resources. And this year, the theme is focusing on non-substance or behavioral addictions. And so these are activities that get in the way of our ideal functioning in our lives. Um, and the interesting thing about most of these activities is that they're not inherently bad. Um, we talk about things like sex, shopping, um, using our screens, our phones. Um, these are all things that we actually um, need to do, right? <laughs> like you, like they're, they're good to do, or they're part of, of a good and rich uh, lived um, experience. Um, but like many things that are good, um, sometimes they can begin to get in their way of um, getting other things done. Um, and sometimes they can become uh, coping mechanisms that aren't uh, ideal. Um, and sometimes they might just be something that we want to uh, change our relationship to. Um, and so I'm really excited to have Andrew Fishman here. Um, he is a licensed clinical social worker with the Juniper Center, working with emerging adults and teens. And um, for tonight in particular, what I'm most interested in is he also has an expertise in screen time, in video games, um, both their use for creating community and connection and exploring identity, um, and also um, how um, we might develop addictions or struggle with our use of those things as well. Um, and so I would love to turn it over to Andrew, who also writes, I should mention, for Psychology Today on this particular topic. I'm so excited to have you in today for a conversation, um, also to, um, to connect you with our community more largely as an amazing resource around this topic. Um, so I just love to uh, jump jump right in with, um, I give a little bit of an introduction about you, but if you want to tell more about yourself, your background, um, the work you do, um, and I think people would really love to know also like how you got into this work. I think social work more generally, but also the area of video games and online communities more specifically. Yeah, thank you for thank you for having me. This is, this is lovely. Uh, <clears throat> My name is Andrew Fishman. I use he, him pronouns. I've been a gamer since I was a since I was a little kid. So when I worked at JCFS at the adolescent sort of wing response for teens, my supervisors would give me all of the kids that they didn't really understand what they were talking about. You know, he's he's talking about buying skins in Fortnite. I don't know what that is. Can you just talk nerd to this kid? So I became the I became the go to for those adolescents and. Uh, ended up working also with all of the students who were gaming instead of doing homework or going to school. And so I found this really interesting. I did as much extra research and reading as I could and just sort of fell in love with connecting people, connecting people around uh, this part of their lives. Thank you. Um, as a as a fellow gamer myself, I appreciate the the nerd connection. Um, and I know that for many people, I think I think teens in particular, like I remember just the power of being able to immerse yourself in a different world, not unlike, you know, reading a book or mm -hmm. um, or kind of finding a, a fandom that you obsess about in terms of like a TV show or um, or even even board games or more kind of these imaginative activities that allow us to connect with people. Um, they allow us to try on new identities. Uh, I think particularly for a lot of, of queer kids I know, for example, the ability to try on um, maybe a gender expression or identity that they don't get to safely um, uh, try out in their lived experience. Um, and even just like decompressing from like the stress of the world um, are all, I think, really wonderful things about, um, about video games, about online spaces. Um, but I'm curious where you begin to see um, uh, problems or the potential for addictive behaviors. Um, kind of how do we, I don't know, like how do we draw that line? Like where do we, I don't know, where do we know where that line exists? It's That's a great question. And unfortunately, it's one that doesn't really have a clear answer for every person. So there's actually an exercise I do with a lot of my clients to get at this question. And I need a volunteer. So I'm calling on you, Rabbi Stephen. Um, it has to do with our values. So I keep actually this deck of values cards. This is my office. Um, these cards say things like family, nonconformity, moderation. I'm gonna put, I'll put them up on the screen. Um, but I ask people to start sorting them into piles of not important, 
important and very important. I'm going to share my screen and put this up. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. <laughs> right, so for most people, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for most people, people value their family as one of their top five or six, let's say, whether that's, you know, biological family, found family, however they're defining it, it's important. So you have to really look inward and assess, is what I'm doing bringing me closer to the people that I love, to my family, or is it pushing us apart? If you are, for example, playing alongside them, or if it helps you relax in a way that makes it easier to be present with them later, then that seems pretty supportive to me. That seems like it is bringing the family unit closer together. On the other hand, if you are missing time with your kids because you can't, because you can't miss a raid, it's probably because something that you want to rethink. And so it really comes down to what you value and what is important to you as a person uh, for whether it is helpful or harmful. So can I ask you to go through this list? I'm going to scroll to and just pick out, let's say, five of your top values. Mm, mm. So in the meantime, I'm just going to read some of these out loud. Um, these are acceptance, accuracy, achievement, authority, autonomy, beauty, caring, change, comfort, commitment, compassion for others, making a contribution in the world, cooperating with others, to yeah. act creatively, to be polite and courteous to people, to live in harmony with the environment, ecology being a value. Stop me when you have a few. Mm, yeah, I have a few. I got, I got some. I was looking at the okay. list as well here. Yeah. So th this is a list um, from motivationalinterviewing.org, but there's a bunch and these are just called values cards. I just laminated and cut these out. That's what I have in my office. So which one, which ones did you pick? Um, so I was looking through them. Um, I feel like compassion, right? To feel and act on concern for others. Um, I really also liked the kind of pair of loved and loving, right? To to be loved by those around me and to also give love to others. Um, openness, um, to be open to new experiences and ideas. Um, and then because I'm in that mood, because we're here at Shabbat, spirituality felt like a, a natural fit. Um, so I think I'll, I'll stick with those, those five, right? It's compassion, to be loved and to love others, uh, to be open and to, and to grow spiritually. So let's let's take uh, compassion, for example. That's okay. the first one you mentioned. I think probably because it's alphabetically first I'm seeing, but that's, that's fine. Um, do you feel like the way that you interact with games is helping you be a compassionate person? Does it ever mm. get in the way of being compassionate and being present for other people in your life? Or is it sort of neutral and it's just a hobby? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um... I, um, so, so, so two things come to mind immediately, just as kind mm -hmm. of a, kind of a quick analysis. One of the ways that uh, my partner I spent together is actually playing games together, which, um, I, I think, I think air was also on that list and they, they mm -hmm. feel related to me, but it, it like even like kind of side by side time or doing a game together can be a way of, of showing care of showing like, a um even an interest in right like like even picking up a game that's like not my normal game but like one that my partner loves is like a way of like you know showing interest and care for and 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 to um and to um have that connective moment i've also learned that if i spend eh, let's say more than an hour like on the screen i can get really grumpy like i can get a little irritable mm -hmm. so I do like i do i've learned to intentionally self-limit this is a, that's something i did a, a long time ago it's become habit now um but i i do remember a time whereas if i spent like all day staring at the screen i would actually get really irritable like i wasn't able to actually have compassion mm -hmm. um, for those around me because i feel kind of drained and and not and not happy so it sounds like it sounds like you've done a lot of reflecting on this already, which is wonderful. And so it sounds like when you're playing with your partner, it is supporting those values of compassion, the pair of loved and loving that you're talking about, and it is bringing the two of you closer together in a way that really supports your values. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned, when there's too much of it, it starts to hinder that. So 
you've already done the step of thinking, you know, may, maybe at those points, it is not supportive of my goals, my values, my, you know, my wishes for myself in the world. And so I should cut back to the point where it is now only supportive of me. Mm. Mm. So would you say that then, I guess, for folks um, could even maybe do like a self-assessment um, mm -hmm. in some of these, uh, um, I think using a very similar tool. Um, I love the idea that it's so values-based. Um, yeah. One of the ways that we try to help people think around even their Jewish practice um, is rather than to start in the practice itself of like, do you do X or Y? Is think, well, you know, kind of what are your values? And then like, mm -hmm. does that actually match up um, with the practice? Uh, I always use the example of like, if you value um, opening up your home, being a host, right? Like mm -hmm. absolutely people are for Shabbat dinner, but if you value like solitude and rest, like having a bunch of people over to your home is probably not a great Jewish practice. So I feel like this feels um, kind of very related. Um, mm -hmm. there. Yeah, I think I think one of the, the big critiques I have with the idea of video games being like a menace to society is that we focus so much on productivity and work and labor as a... Uh, almost a measure of worth. And I, I I reject that in a fundamental way. I don't think that, you know, if work is important to you, great. That If that is a value that is inherent to who you are and what you want, how you want to live your life, wonderful. That should be on your list. If it's not, if you are a person who can't work or, you know, for, for whatever reason, that doesn't mean that the games that you're playing are making your life worse or that it's their fault or that you should be ashamed of it or that you need to change anything. Mm -hmm. Leisure time is important. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that the pressure that we all have to constantly be going is a healthy one. So I'm glad that you mentioned that it's, uh, it, it's individual. Mm -hmm. What are, I'm curious, what are, you know, working with um, folks who engage in these particular communities? I mean, you know, obviously knowing that some, some gaming communities are very solo, right? So solo activities, some of them are much more um, collaborative, right? Either with people in person or with people online. Um, I'm curious, what are some of the benefits that you see, right, for this kind of online community? Um, as you mentioned earlier, the, the idea to try on a new persona. I know people in my personal and professional lives who are trans or non-binary and the first way that they started to experiment was playing a game. Animal Crossing doesn't limit the clothing that you choose to to the gender you select, the you know the the shape of the face and whether it has eyelashes or not. So maybe they try on a dress, and does that make them feel cute, or does it make them feel kind of weird? If and that can give you some information about how you want to then express yourself in a uh, more challenging way later maybe by putting on one in, in, in real life. Games are a safe way to practice that kind of thing and to practice talking to people, to build relationships, to build skills in a way that is not nearly as challenging as going out to a crowded room and just trying to make a friend is. It's a shared activity, it's safe, it's familiar, and you can do it as much or as little as you like. Um. So I wanted to say, you know, we're a, we're a community of um, not all people might be familiar with the gaming community. And so some people might be like, oh, well, what, what is this? Like, what does this have to do with me? Um, but I'm so conscious of the fact that, like, you know, we're doing an online Shabbat service right now. We're having an yeah. online Yeah. Um, actually, um, nearly 10% of our membership is out of state. Um, so oh, their wow. primary engagement with us is through screens. We also have a really amazing um, disability and chronic illness uh, group that meets regularly that often engages online and with our services, our classes, all of those things. And then for other folks, because of childcare and commuting, and, and there's a million reasons that people might want to engage um, with community online. Um, so... So kind of with the, like, I guess the question I have is with the joy and the opportunity for access, with the fact that like, we also just need to get online to like check emails and do bills, mm -hmm. right? How do we actually develop some good boundaries and like healthy habits? If we suddenly say like, okay, I know that like, I'm going to open up YouTube and like get lost in it for hours and hours and hours. And I really want to get onto YouTube to like watch services tonight. Like how, like, I don't know, what are strategies that people can think about of like kind of helping create boundaries um, to to uh, create space for the good while also maybe like um, not uh, not kind of falling into to 
old habits or, or habits that might we might not service in that moment. Yeah. Um, for me, I try to I try to be intentional about when I am when I'm playing a game, when I'm on screens and what I'm doing. So I want to make sure, for example, that every time I turn on a game, it's because I am choosing to. If I get to the point where I'm only playing a game because I'm going to miss out on something if I don't log on or I'm playing a game, even though I don't really like that game because I feel obligated or because there's social pressure to, it's probably time for me to move on from that game. If I like a TV show and I'm watching it because it is my choice to use my leisure time in that way, great. If I feel more stressed out after watching it and I don't like the show all that much and I just feel like I can't not watch it, that's that's a bad sign. So. For me, it is a, a matter of stepping back and in the moment thinking, why am I why am I doing this right now? Did I just open Instagram because it was a reflex and I didn't even notice until it was in my hand and on and on? Um, then that's that feels different than, you know what? I am curious about what people are going on or are posting right now. I'm going to go on Instagram and then opening the app. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So so then going back to values, if I notice that I'm neglecting things that are important to me, it also might be time to reassess. Mm-hmm. Well, I love the idea of bringing kind of a consciousness into your practice. I mean, that's so much what, um, I mean, that's what Shabbat's about. It's what ritual it really is about. I always say that ritual, um, whether one kind of invests in kind of ritual having that, like a cosmological significance or um, or just being part of the chain of tradition, connecting us to community identity, um, regardless of why we do ritual, one of the things that I think is so beautiful about it is that it, it disrupts us. It actually like says, hey, pay attention to this moment. Like what, why? Mm-hmm. Like, why are you lighting candles right now? Like, you know, why, why are we singing this song? You know, we're about to do passive, which is actually all about like all these things, getting us to ask the questions that actually lead us to retell the Passover story, right? It's this kind of awareness of the moment. Um, you know, it almost makes me think that there should be like a, like a blessing or ritual before like opening mm-hmm. your screen, like just something <laughs> like, Hey, like I'm actually bringing consciousness right now. I think one of the things I'm thinking about is that, um, and I don't know if it comes from a, a malicious, I don't think it comes from a malicious place. I think it just comes from a, like, we want more users to engage with us kind of place. But um, so many games, social media certainly um, develop mechanisms to kind of like, like push that little like dopamine button. Mm-hmm. Like it's the like, it's the, um, it's the points, it's the, you know, kind of log in now for this like very limited time opportunity to do X, Y, Z. Um if we find that that kind of hook keeps bringing us back in, I don't know if you have any any thoughts around that, like how, how we might how we might address that. The, the first thing that I recommend people do is to start noticing those things because they're they're at their at their most insidious, they're invisible. So when people are when when games are really designed to be habit forming, you don't notice that they are. You don't notice that. You know, I I just started playing Candy Crush sort of as an experiment a few days ago. And it's amazing how many of these things they've baked into the game. I'm currently in, it it puts you into two or three different competitions with other users, and then they're giving you rewards. And then if you play every single day, then you get more points and you get different points if you do it twice a day. And you, and every time you beat a level in a row, and then you can get power-ups. There's so many different things that they're using to just keep you coming back they need that engagement and they're really trying to use every uh every method possible to do that so the first step is just to notice what they're doing and almost get annoyed by it because i i know that when i i have i have stopped playing games but i just when i recognize enough of those tools that they're using and i think that's that's really crummy i don't want you to have to try to manipulate me like that i don't want to have to keep coming back every day when i don't want to i'm on vacation right now and i'm thinking about this game i don't like that and so i i find that motivates people to really start that process it's just to step step back examine what they're doing and why they're doing it and that goes back to the mindfulness why did i just open that app why did i do this thing why has it been an hour and i didn't notice that i've been scrolling on facebook for this long what are they doing that made it that made time so invisible for me in that moment? Hmm. Hmm. You know, it's it's kind of reminded me of both. I think a combination of like watching the social dilemma, which I feel like mm-hmm. you know, it was yeah. very 
And so then we're kind of like those conscious raising moments for how how those mechanisms around social media in particular mm-hmm. pull us in. Um, and then the advent of like the do not disturb function um, and yeah. having that realization of like, oh, like I actually didn't open Instagram for an hour because it wasn't like poking me with notifications. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I should actually just like turn those notifications off. Like that, yeah. that you know, cause it's that noticing, like you said, and that kind of like annoyance a little mm-hmm. bit of like, oh wait, like, like I wasn't even thinking about it before because it would just pop up with a, somebody like something, you know, or so-and-so mm-hmm. posted it for the first time in a long time. Um, yeah. I turn all of those off because I just, it's hundreds of times a day mm-hmm. and it's so distracting. It's, it's so intrusive. And I, I, I just don't want them to be constantly running. Hey, go to Instagram, go to Instagram every, every hour or two, I'm getting a notification that it's telling me to do something that I don't want to do in that moment. So I, I turning off notifications is absolutely one of the first steps. Yeah. yeah. And the beauty is that, you know, you can, you can modulate, right? Like, so mm-hmm. I, for me, it's like everything on Instagram, except for like direct messages, which is like, yeah. oh, contact me. Like that's the mm-hmm. only one that pops through, but even, you know, they can toggle, which is, which yeah. is a nice thing about the moment we live in. Mm-hmm. Um, so kind of speaking about, about the ways that technology can actually work with or for us. Um, like what kind of opportunities do you see around online engagement, um, whether that's online community or through gaming specifically, um, and how we might like actually use it for positive mental health and well-being? Yeah. Um, the most obvious one for me, as you mentioned, is the ability to connect with other people. We're we're connecting right now because the internet exists, because Zoom exists. Um and we're better off because of that. I'm able to see clients from all across Illinois because we have that, we both have access to the internet. Mm-hmm. And so I'm able to reach people who would not otherwise have access to mental health services in their community or or wouldn't have support of mental health in their, you know, services in their community. And they, they can access it from their bedroom if they want to. It's so much easier. Plus, COVID lockdowns would have been unbelievably worse if we couldn't also talk to each other online during that time. Mm-hmm. online gaming was really crucial for me in staying connected with my friends and I'm sitting alone in my apartment doing nothing every day but I get to play Jackbox games with a group of college friends every couple of nights that helped keep me whole in that time mm-hmm. you know it's it's interesting I think so many um, different communities are starting to realize like how um, those technologies and those connections that have always that have existed for a long time um, could become so, um, I don't know, just so important, so useful in such a, like a meaningful way of connection, right? Like, like the kind of like the the nerds were doing it, like you know, a long time ago. And now mm-hmm. it's like, oh, this is catching up. And like, oh wait, like you know, you can you can really seek out like people who are just like you, right? People who have shared. Yeah people who um, people have a shared identity um, or even uh, to create relationships of mentorship and support and Mm -hmm. advice and connection um, in a way that's really powerful. I, I, it's, you know, it, it really amazes me to see, you know, these moments. I think I, I, you know, like a a vignette I always remember um, was that first, I think it was actually Passover is that first Passover um, during lockdown you know, all of a sudden, all these things that were in person went online and um, somebody logged in a little bit early for a Passover event I was doing. Um, and they said that they were like a Jew living in, I think it was like rural Wyoming. And they're like, I haven't done a Jewish thing for like 10 years. And they're like, I get to do a Jewish thing now. I'm like, that's so cool. <laughs> like, yeah. Amazing. You know, that kind of opportunity. Um, do you, do you feel like, I, I'm just curious, do you feel like gaming can even be brought into um like your practice of like supporting people's mental health um i don't know if there's any like a new or exciting technologies that are emerging right now that you've seen or even ideas that you dream about oh yeah i mean you can see right there is a i have an xbox and a switch plugged into a tv on the wall i play with a lot of my clients um for a few different reasons i i find that it helps build rapport very quickly especially with young people who are reluctant to go to therapy or to talk to some new adult that they're supposed to be able to talk to but they've never it just helps break the ice it helps uh it's easier to talk to somebody while you're sharing an activity if i'm playing mario kart with somebody then i can just ask casually you know how's how's school going and it sounds more casual than i mean than i actually am because i'm really assessing how is their school behavior how is their you know how is what is their social life like 
but it, I, we're just playing Mario Kart, and I'm just asking, you know, what are your friends up to? Mm. A lot safer that way. I also use it as a, a kind of uh, intentional intervention where some parents will tell me that their kids are pitching a fit, throwing things while they're gaming. They've broken a keyboard or two. The most efficient way for me to help those kids is just to practice being frustrated in a video game during a therapy session. And so if they really like Mario Kart, for example, that's when I play a lot, that's a game that's really frustrating. That's a game where you could be in first place and you can even get hit with a blue shell and you get sent back to eighth place and then you have to deal with that. And so while I'm playing with them, I'm watching their body language. I'm helping them notice when they have started to get uh, when they started to get angry. You know, did you did you notice that your hands are really tense right now? Did you notice that your body language just shifted? I think you're getting angry. Let's pause the game. Do those breathing exercises we talked about. Help cool yourself down. And then let's keep going. And do that over and over and over again. And it works very quickly to help rewire the brain into being uh, a better loser, helping calm yourself down much faster. And it just it just works as an intervention. So if if, if parents can do that with their kids, that works too. Hmm. That's um, really cool. I love that. The, I I also I also <laughs> am now gathering that you must be really, really good at Mario Kart that you're able to play it and also <laughs> yeah. <laughs> notice I play, and, I, I play like four hours a week of mario kart <laughs> <laughs> that's phenomenal yeah. um is there anything else that you would like to share about about your work about um i don't know anything that you feel is important for us to to know um there are some other cool games while i'm just on the topic that are intentionally therapeutic um there's one called endeavor which is they they, they did a study or two where if you play this game for 15 minutes a day for three weeks or something similar, uh, symptoms of ADHD decrease significantly. That You're able to focus more in school and on things that you want to focus on. There's another game called Ava. I don't know if it's out yet. I played a pre-release thing. Uh, it's by autistic people for autistic people to help build social skills and confidence. Uh, she goes up to people and um, I took a screenshot. She had, uh, she'll, she'll say to somebody, um, you know, she'll, she'll make a mistake and your options at the bottom are say you're sorry, but that you didn't mean it. Say you're sorry and what you're sorry for. Say you're sorry and that they should forgive you or say you're sorry that they feel hurt. And those are pretty subtle differences, but they mean very different things to people. So if you say the wrong thing, if you say you should forgive me, then the character goes, well, that didn't feel good. And she goes, shoot, I should really rethink that. I'll bet this is what went wrong with that interaction. So you, you, while playing this fun game, you're practicing all these really subtle social skills, which is very cool. Uh, I've even heard virtual reality games being used as exposure therapy. Mm -hmm. I know people who, uh, I know someone who is a therapist who uh, will have the person go put on a virtual reality headset and it looks and sounds like you're in a crowded room of people and your goal in the therapy space is just to walk up to somebody and start a conversation. And it's scary because it feels like you're in a real room, but it's safe because you're actually in the therapy space. You're actually just with your therapist. The therapist is the one who's actually talking to you when you go up to a stranger, but it's really good practice. So there's a lot of developing technologies that are being used very creatively to help with different things. That's really amazing. That's amazing to hear. Well, I really appreciate you spending some time with us this evening um, and for bringing the passion and the care um, that you bring to your work to the space as well. Um, and I, I'm excited to see um, how this continues to progress into the future, how these technologies continue to develop and how we um, continue to utilize this technology um, for the best, right? For bringing us together, for exploring who we are um, and for connecting like we've done tonight. So thank you again, Andrew. Thank uh, you very much.